Hi folks, welcome back to the channel. It's another Friday night RV side chat with uh, Sean and Corinne from Travels of Red Rover. Last week on their channel, we talked about the one piece of gear that you could possibly not live without when doing landscape photography. Shelly, what are we talking about this week? We're talking about each of our photographic visions. Everyone has one and that's what we're talking about this week. What makes your photographs unique to you, basically? Stay tuned till the end of the episode where we're going to tell you what we're talking about with them next week on their channel. So, playing off of your use of vision, of what you're envisioning of a photograph, I think that's where a lot of, I'm going to call them noobs, noobs get into problems is they don't yet have enough experience knowing what that vision is for a photograph that they're wanting to make. They, yeah. They've got their camera. They, they finally figured out how to get out of program or full auto. Yeah. But they're not sure exactly what the vision of the visual story is for that photograph. And they don't know how to complete the story. That's, I, we find that, I mean, Karina and I teach photography. And we, we often run up against that. We actually run up against two scenarios. One is they've gotten to the point where they can have a vision of what they want to get, but they simply don't have the gear that, you know, they've gone out and they've seen, you know, a forest photographer like Simon Baxter mm -hmm. or Adam Gibbs. And, you know, they produce this phenomenal photograph. And so they have a vision of what that can look like, but either they don't have the gear they don't have the experience with the gear um, in order to actually duplicate that vision. They can't. They can't get there for the lack of uh, uh, of the gear. If you don't have the warming polarizer that I'm using, you're not going to get the same image that I can get with the warming polarizer. I know gear shouldn't matter, but when it gets to that point, gear starts to matter in terms of executing on the vision. That's why it kind of annoys me when I see videos of photographers going, gear doesn't matter. Well, it, it depends on what gear you're talking about right. and what you're trying to achieve. Because there are certain instances where, okay, if gear doesn't matter, then I should be able to take a camera out without a tripod, without an LBRAC, without filters, and get the perfect image, right? And I'm sure there are people out there that will tell you they can do that, but I can't. I call BS. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, there are instances where you don't need a tripod, you don't need filters, sure. you don't need all that stuff. But when you, you know the vision of the final product, the final outcome that you want, and you have a clearly defined vision in your head, then what you need to know is, do I have everything to complete it? Mm -hmm. Okay, time of day. Is it going to require a tripod? Okay, so for morning light, afternoon light, sunset, blue hour, golden hour, what have you. Nine times out of ten, you're shooting at your native lowest ISO on a camera. So you're going to need a, a good tripod, a good ball head, a good uh, L bracket. Mm -hmm. And from my previous experiences, since, you know, uh, 1990-something, I'm not going to date myself quite yet. Uh, you have multiple ways to suffer the pain in the gear world. You can buy the cheap tripod at your local big box store multiple times until you realize that the really right stuff, the FLM, the Benro, uh, get so tripod legs are really actually worth the investment. Yeah, because they are you can take them apart If something breaks you can get that part and repair it. There are reasons why they are more expensive Yep, you know since I got my really right stuff tripod. I have not I've knocked it over I've fallen down on it. I've done things that would have trashed that 50 maybe even a hundred dollar tripod that you buy at a big box store. Yeah I still have every piece of the original tripod that I paid all that money for. And yeah. it still functions the way it did when I first bought it. So Creed and I use Benro. Uh, it's no longer built. It's over 10 years old. 
the model that the model that we have yeah. and that we use. In fact, when I heard that they were no longer going to build that model, I bought another tripod, and uh, the uh, we had a tripod fail on us. Um, we had me fail a tripod on us. <laughs> like you say, falling on is not good for a tripod. Not usually. No. Um, but between that, so I switched over to the new one, and then I've used my old one for parts. And um, about once a year, I sort of rebuild the two tripods. You know, clean them up quite regularly, but um, rebuild the tripods. And I would be hard... I, I, you know, it's a carbon fiber, but it's the old heavier carbon fiber tripod. You practically had to tear it out of my dead hands in order to uh, replace it. Now, do I think there were other great tripods out there? Absolutely. There are lots of manufacturers that make great tripods. But I can use that thing in my sleep. Yeah. And I know exactly how it's going to react to every lens I have, um, which is critical. I mean, you know, when I switch from my kit lens mm -hmm. to my... Uh, my uh, wide angle to my long 400 millimeter lens um, I know exactly how the ball head is going to react to that I know how much extra pressure I need I know how to center it up and I don't have to think about it it's yeah. mm -hmm. it's just it's all it's memory of the hands yeah. and I th that's the part that really mm -hmm. frustrates me it's, um, is that I would not have I'd have to you know if you stuck me with your tripod could I make it work yeah but I'd have to think about every action with the tripod. And so that's another thing that I, I really think that noobs need to do is, you know, you, you get your camera, you get your, your tripod, you need to be able to do that stuff in the dark. Because with the Astro stuff that we've been doing out here, if I didn't know where my buttons were, I'd have my red headlight on the whole time trying yeah. to figure out, mm -hmm. you know, the, the red light doesn't kill your night vision, but it will kill your shock. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. And all and your partner's shots, mm -hmm. they toss you off that cliff. <laughs> and when you're standing there with three other photographers, and even if you're 20 feet apart or more, you can you can affect their whole image all the way out yep. to, with that red filter. Especially since we start getting into long exposures mm -hmm. and someone flashes a light, you know, in the middle of a long exposure, well... That 40 minute exposure is done. Yep. Yeah. So uh, yes, it's uh, it's kind of a critical thing. One of the things that students tell us um, from our our, our uh, the students that take our night photography class, we we just call it uh, uh, dark sky photography. How do we call that? Desert night sky. Desert night sky photography, where we're not specific about what shooting stars or moon or just what we're doing. It's basically shooting. It's basically shooting in the dark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the comment we get more times than not is people will come off of that class and go, really love the class, really love learning how to do the stars, but my God, I learned how to use my camera so much better. Um, because, you know, we take them out in the middle of the night with no lights, and we, you know, we enforce sort of a light, um, uh, you know, we police the lights, which means they've got to find their buttons mm -hmm. with their fingers. Uh, and uh, the, you know, so many of them learn so much yeah. when that when we do that. It's like, um, I guess the analogy, a good analogy would be, a member of armed services has to know how to disassemble and reassemble their weapon blindfolded. Right. A good photographer should be able to change their ISO, change um, any setting on their camera without being able to see but feel the buttons. Likewise, yeah. change their ball head uh, tension and yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's all done. Uh, it's all done by hand memory. Yeah, and also remember where you place your legs because if you kick your tripod over the edge of that <laughs> fifty-foot cliff and there's no way to get down there, it's not yeah. a good night. It's not, not a good night. night. And uh, I think that uh, I think that's something we should mention is actually so when he's talking about being on a fifty-year-old. 100 or 200 foot cliff which we did regularly this last 10 days um we we did actually review those in the light yeah. to know where they were yeah. and we did also review all of the pathways to and from the cameras yep. before we were there the night time yeah you don't go out in the dark and try to find your composition and i guess you could do it with today's camera technology you could just take 
any number of shots to figure out where you're at yeah. at the right ISO and stuff and actually find it. Pardon me, I have a drinking problem. <laughs> Let me see if I can find a little spot. Um, but yeah, it's, that's something to be said is we're out there before sunset, well before sunset, yep. the last couple of nights, looking at the locations because, well, in Badlands, most of the overlooks are truly overlooks and there, there might be a trail down to the bottom, but yep. you might have to hike quite a long ways to get down to yep. it. And the last thing anybody wants in the middle of the night is to fall off of a, or tumble down one of those yeah. structures. And, I mean, you might want to comment on this, but we go a lot of places. Yeah, you guys have done more. Well, when we do a night photography, we often will use the same location for our sunset photography. So you might be compromising slightly mm -hmm. on, it might not be the ideal sunset spot, but that will give me time to get familiar with my environment mm -hmm. and get really tuned into what my composition is going to be. Yeah. And then I'll start doing my night photography. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what we do every time, and it's pretty much the process. Or if we're not going to do sunset photography there, we're going to be there by blue hour, so that we still can see clearly where everything else is is going to be. Well, we hope you enjoyed that little RV side chat about our photographic visions with Sean and Corrine from Travels of Red Rover. Tune in next week on their channel, Travels of Red Rover, when we're going to be talking about whether or not to use filters. It's actually fairly enlightening, you know, because I'm more of the, I'll take the brackets and I'll use NDs, and they're more of the, we use the filters all the time in the field. So it's very informative. So stay tuned for that next week on their channel. And we'd love to thank you so much for watching. Yes. And we would highly encourage you, if you haven't done so yet, please hit that subscribe button, ding the bell for future notifications, ding. and give us a big thumbs up. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.